This video is made possible by you guys, our Patreon supporters. Click the link in the description to find out how to get early access to our content, receive frequent updates on upcoming projects, and be mentioned in the credits of all of our videos. Please click the link in the description or stick around to the end to learn more. Surveillance, executions, gruesome rituals, the darkest duties drive the wheels of mankind. A lone tarnished arrives in the lands between, knowing little of their purpose. But one thing is for certain, the road ahead is perilous. The inhabitants of the lands between will attempt to extinguish the flame of the tarnished. The journey will be one of torment, but without struggle there can be no reward. Arising in the Chapel of Anticipation, they are greeted by the corpse of a Finger Maiden. The Maidens live to serve a chosen Tarnished, sharing their guidance and the wisdom of the Two Fingers. Exiting the Chapel, we are halted by a grafted scion, nobles who followed Godric, dregs of the Golden Lineage, who sought power and purpose in the past. Under the shadow of Queen Marika's statue, the sign slaughters the newly awakened. Barely conscious, the tarnished is approached by a maiden and her steed. The cloaked individual appears to be searching for one who would seek the Elden Ring. Her goals are obscure, and her identity remains hidden. Surveying the perimeter, we find ourselves in a damp cavern, illuminated by a golden tree. It seems as though the Maiden had left the Tarnished with various healing items, the flasks of crimson and cerulean tears, a sacred flask modelled after a golden holy chalice that was once graced by a tear of life. It is said that a Finger Maiden will bestow two such chalices upon the chosen Tarnished when they meet. The one washed up on the gravesite was sure to die until this flask offered its gift of rejuvenation to seek the Elden Ring. The supposed Finger Maiden appears to have saved the life of the Tarnished, offering them a means to restore their vitality and a vague purpose. Venturing forth, the Tarnished enters the domain of Limgrave, a territory far south of the Erdtree, bordered to the northwest by the cliffs of Stormvale, where its ruler Godric resides. The skies above remain ever clouded, basking over the great steps of the Pale Lands. The Erdtree stands firmly above, its aura flooding the horizon in rays of golden light. Blessed sap once dripped from its boughs, but as the age of plenty came to a close, the tree instead came to be worshipped as an object of faith, a monument of the Golden Order, a shining beacon of their might. The answers we seek surely lie within its heart. One could easily mistake the beauty of Limgrave for comfort. However, every corner of this region is filled with malice. A stalwart tree sentinel patrols the hills on horseback, wielding a mighty golden halberd, an armament difficult for any mere human to wield, a testament to their strength. The sentinels are the living rampart of the Erdtree, they are the standard to which all defenders of the tree aspire. Guardians also provide aid in its preservation, humans who had formed an ancient pact with the Erdtree. It is said that their deaths led not to destruction, but instead to renewed, eternal life as guardians. From the roots of the Erdtree, minor trees have sprouted from the land. Crystal tears are formed slowly over the ages, where the Erdtree's bounty falls to the ground. Basins are placed at the feet of minor Erdtrees, throughout the lands between, in order to collect their crystallized tears. This flora is safeguarded by Erdtree avatars and ulcerated tree spirits. They emerged in the wake of the Elden Ring shattering, determined to protect the Erdtree's offspring. Appearing to hold great power, 
the Erd tree has given life and purpose to these creatures. Beneath the lands between is an underground network of catacombs, structures housing the bodies of those who were laid to rest through Erd tree burial. Their remains are protected by the watchdogs. They are battered and broken due to their lengthy tenure ruling over the tombs. These entities are yet another guardian of the Erd tree. In the distance, a sight of grace can be seen. This tiny golden aura is the grace of the Erd tree, the very light that once shone in the eyes of the tarnished. Close by, the war surgeon White Mask Vare speaks out to the tarnished. Oh yes, tarnished are we? Come to the lands between for the Elden Ring, hmm? Unfortunately for you, however, you are maidenless. Without guidance, without the strength of runes, and without an invitation to the round table hold, you are fated, it seems, to die in obscurity. Are you familiar with grace? the golden light that gives life to you tarnished. You may also behold its golden rays pointing in a particular direction at times. That is the guidance of grace, a path that a tarnished must travel, even if it leads you to your grave. Grace's guidance will reveal the path forward, most certainly, to Castle Stormvale, over on the cliff, the home of the decrepit demigod, Godric the Grafted. The cunning surgeon offers sound advice, however, his friendly nature is naught but a facade, veiling his malicious intent. For now, we have little choice but to heed his words and begin the pursuit of Godric. Advancing further, we come upon the Church of Allah. A multitude of these holy landmarks are found throughout the lands between, places of worship with historical significance. Housed within each structure are statues of Queen Marika and Radagon, a reminder of the people's devotion to the Order. Blessings were bestowed upon the devout through the use of sacred tears. During the age of the Erd tree, these tears were used to spread the faith, for theirs was once a certain blessing. Residing in this decrepit chapel is the merchant Calais. The land has been tainted by madness since the shattering of the Elden Ring. It's only tarnished like yourself who keep things from drying up entirely. The tradesman describes the dire state of the lands between. Furthermore, he makes note of his people, urging us to both protect and offer them trade. He warns us that invoking their wrath is to be avoided, as they are deeply unforgiving. Their firm stance most likely stems from the punishment they endured by the Golden Order, a grudge which still burns within their soul. Should the need arise, they will retaliate, but if left to their own devices, they will remain as peaceful tradesmen. Crossing the fields of Limgrave, the tarnished narrowly avoids a detachment of Godric soldiers, a common foe in this land. Nearby, a sight of grace provides a moment of respite for the weary tarnished. It is here where we are once again greeted by the enigmatic maiden. She reveals herself to be Melina, an alleged Finger Maiden. Have you heard of the Finger Maidens? They serve the Two Fingers, offering guidance and aid to the Tarnished. But you, I am afraid, are maidenless. I can play the role of maiden, turning runes into strength to aid you in your search for the Elden Ring. You need only take me with you to the foot of the Erd Tree. 
Additionally, she implores the Tarnished to seek out the demigod Godric, who inherited a fragment of the Elden Ring. The pact between the Tarnished and Melina will aid both parties. The Maiden will assist the Tarnished in search of the Elden Ring, in exchange for being guided to the base of the Erdtree. Lastly, she gifts us a whistle, an instrument that can be used to summon a spectral steed, allowing the Tarnished to traverse the vast stretches of the lands between. As their conversation concludes, Melina vanishes, but rest assured, she remains ever at our side. Along the journey, the Tarnished encounters Bok, a demi-human who became a seamster, following in the footsteps of his mother. Should we find his mother's sewing needle, it can be returned to him, for which he is grateful. As time passes, Bok believes that above all other Tarnished, we will become Elden Lord. Moreover, he appears to be a severely insecure individual, an insecurity stemming from his physical appearance, as he refers to himself as ugly. For this reason, he suggests a visit to Renala, in order to utilise her power and be reborn. Should the Tarnished grant Bok a larval tear, a material required by the Amber Egg, cradled by Renala, Queen of the Full Moon, to birth people anew, he will journey to Rhea Lucaria Academy. After undergoing the process of rebirth, he takes on a form much akin to the malformed students of the Academy. The seamster is unable to speak, a symptom of his rebirth. Shortly after, Bok is found dead, a tragic end for one who sought to eradicate their self-doubt by erasing who they once were. Is it worth going to such lengths, destroying oneself to fit into normality? The fate of the seamster need not be so tragic. Found within the hermit's village is a prattling pate, a twisted clay sculpt of a demi-human head. It emits a voice, stating, you're beautiful. The object embodies unconditional love, unrestrained assurance. It must have been a mother speaking. You're beautiful. Thank you very much. Mum was always the only one who said I was beautiful. And now, my dear Lord, let me hear her voice. Oh, please. If I may dream just once, do you feel the same way my mum did, my lord? Do you think I'm beautiful despite these looks? Should the tarnished reply with yes, he will proclaim, My lord, my dear lord, I, Bok the seamster, am forever in your service. May the throne of Elden Lord be yours. Near the seaside ruins, the bloody finger hunter Yora is encountered. He advises the Tarnished to stay clear of the dragon Ajil, found patrolling the skies above the lake. Confronting and felling the great flying dragon rewards us with its heart. An offering used in the dragon communion, consume a dragon's heart at the altar to make its power yours. Magma worms are the result of such communion. Those who have performed the Dragon Communion will find their humanity slowly slipping away. Once they fully succumb to their fate, they are left no more than worms that crawl the earth. Those who participated in such communion, an act in which one consumes the heart of a dragon, were abhorred by dragon kind. This unholy ritual led to the founding of the Church of Dragon Communion. Followers of this faith aptly named themselves the Dragon-Hearted. Their vile acts invoke the ire of Exykes, the Dragon Communion Revenger. He did not forget his hatred even as he succumbed to the Scarlet Rot, hunting the Dragon-Hearted with no remorse. In regards to Yora, as his title would suggest, he is a hunter of bloody fingers. He describes them as Tarnished, held in thrall by cessblood. 
zealots who stalk their own. Just remember, no kinship with their elk remains. Their madness precludes it. Don't let your emotions stay your blade. The Tarnished can assist Yura in his hunt, aiding him in the assassination of Bloodyfinger Nereus and the Ravenmount assassin. Nereus wields the dagger Reduvia, indicating their allegiance to the Lord of Blood Moog. At the Second Church of Marika, Yura is found mortally wounded. Mustering the strength to speak, the hunter mutters his final words. Eleonora, it seems I am no match for you, but I've learned a thing or two myself. You see, I've sliced the finger off. Please, please, Eleonora, yield to the cesspit no longer. Do not stain the immaculacy of your sword. Your flesh. Your fire. Eleonora hails from the land of reeds, Yora's homeland. It seems the Ronin believed his target could be redeemed. Emotions stayed his blade, resulting in his passing, a contradiction of the very advice he gave to us. The tarnish succeeds where Yora cannot, defeating the violet bloody finger. Though the plains of Limgrave are rife with danger, there seems to be no shortage of friendly faces. Hello? Can you hear me? Help me, I'm stuck. I am Alexander, also known as the Iron Fist. And as you can see, I'm stuck here. Please, can you help me out of this? Alexander is a living jar, objects that are brought to life by human flesh and blood. They are all rather kindly folk. Perhaps they were made to be better than their innards. The colossal jar is stuck in the ground. He requests us to give him a firm smack from the rear to knock him out of the hole. The tarnished obliges, freeing the jar from his prison. Their paths converge once more at the Gale Tunnel. When speaking with Alexander, he elaborates that many great warriors reside within his vessel. They dream eternally of becoming a champion. Due to this, Alexander has embarked on this quest to become a fabled fighter. He makes note of a festival of combat held at Redmain Castle, the seat of Starsker Dradan. Participating in this gauntlet will allow Alexander to test and better himself, to fell legendary foes and eventually become the mythical warrior he believes he can be. For now, the two part ways. Upon Storm Hill, the Tarnished makes contact with D, Hunter of the Dead, a man clad in gold and silver armour. The intricate design of his suit resembles D and his twin brother. They are of two bodies and minds, but one single soul. Not once do they stand together, not one word do they speak to one another. Perhaps this armour longs to find its way to the other D. The masked man warns us of beings known as those who live in death. He advises to avoid the nearby death-touched village, as it is overrun by the undead and a tibia mariner, a shepherd of the undying. His purpose is to eliminate them, as they are a blasphemy against the Golden Order. Their immortal existence prevents them from returning to the Erd Tree. In turn, D hunts the undead, prying death root from their frames. The masked man instructs the tarnished to seek out Garank, beast clergyman, for Deathroot belongs to Garank, not the undead. As night falls upon the green hills of Limgrave, the knight's cavalry arrive, dreadful knights who don a cloak of shadow and armour as black as night. They wield weighty, jet black armaments while riding funeral steeds. The knight's cavalry who now wander the dim roads at night, were once led by the fell omen, and were deliverers of death for great warriors, knights, and champions. 
Loyal to Morgoth, these soldiers hunt in the dark, a reminder that the fell omen is not to be trifled with, and that his rule is still in effect. Returning to the Church of Ella, a biting chill fills the air. The Lunar Princess Rani reveals herself, disguised as a pale doll, resembling her tutor, the Snow Witch Rena. Akin to Melina, she provides assistance to the Tarnished, granting them a spirit calling bell, an item that enables the host to summon Ashen Spirits to fight by their side. These souls are yet to return to the Earth Tree, and as such, can be called upon for aid. Rani ponders when the Tarnished will tire of their obeisance to the Two Fingers, whereas Melina shepherds us to become Elden Lord, Rani seeks to end the cyclical rule of the Golden Order. As of this moment, Rani doubts we will meet again, hinting that she does not believe that we will support her cause. After a few parting words, Rani disappears, and the cold along with her. Moving forward, the Tarnished encounters a man-wolf atop the Mistwood runes. Unable to draw the man's attention, we return to the merchant Calais, who teaches us the finger-snap gesture. With this, the creature can be called down from his perch. He introduces himself as Blythe. In defiance of the fate he was born to, Blythe swore to serve no master but Rani. As proof, the sword was imbued with the cold magic. At the moment, the oath was sworn. He would defy destiny itself if it would have him turn upon his lady. Blythe instructs us to seek out the large blacksmith at Rhea Lucaria. We can discern that Rani has assembled a small team of like-minded individuals to further her goal of ending the age of the Golden Order. Should they choose to follow Blythe's guidance, the Tarnish will be one step closer to joining Rani's cause. Leaving the Wolfman behind, the Tarnish journeys to Murkwater Cave. Here they jewel patches the Untethered. Before delivering the final blow, Patches pleads us to spare his life. Feeling sympathy, the Tarnished obliges. Patches will open up shop. Amongst his wares is Margit's shackle. Shackles were used to bind the accursed people called the Omen, and these ones were made to keep a particular Omen under strictest confinement, an item that may prove useful later. Patches states, that he mistook us for a demi-human, leading him to ambush us. In addition, he implores us to open the nearby chest, as thanks for allowing him to live. The chest in question is but another trap sprung forth by the conspiring merchant. If touched, the chest will transport the tarnished to the location of a rune bear. Seeking vengeance, Patches once again attempts to kill the tarnished but this time without getting his hands dirty. Visiting Patches once more, he appears shocked to see us survive the deadly encounter. Lastly, Patches states that he will leave this cave behind. Perhaps he realised he could no longer swindle the Tarnished, therefore he has decided to move his operation elsewhere. Delving deeper into the wilds of Limgrave, we meet a lone wanderer. Everyone's been grafted. Everyone who came with me. They crossed the sea for me. They fought for me. <laughs> Only to have their arms taken. Their legs taken. Even their heads taken. Taken and stuck to the spider. Did you know if you're grafted by the spider? You become a chrysalid. It's quite the lark when you think about it. The worrisome lady warns of the dangers her people had faced. She notes that her courage is lacking, referring to herself as a craven. By means of assisting us, she offers a spirit jellyfish, a creature that can aid us in the battles to come. Despite being left behind, she holds fast to hope. 
instructing us to deliver a message to the chrysalids in Stormvale Castle. Unfortunately, the beings she refers to have been sacrificed for grafting, as confirmed by the chrysalids' memento. Memento left by the chrysalids sacrificed for grafting, a brooch wrapped in red velvet. Traces of blood are visible. Faintly visible spirits try to convey something, but their voices cannot be heard. Delivering this message results in her withdrawing to a place known as the Round Table Hold, where, according to her, she will seek a new purpose. The solemn end to her companion's journey has granted her a spark of hope. She will not let them die in vain. Throughout Limgrave, the footsteps of a titanic beast can be heard, accompanied by the sound of a droning bell. These creatures are known as the Walking Mausoleums. The mausoleum is where the bodies of soulless demigods are lain to rest, and these soldiers followed their masters into death by severing their own heads from their bodies. Its bell rings in constant mourning for the soulless demigods. Headless mausoleum knights endlessly guard these nomadic entities. Their armor is adorned with wing-shaped ornaments evoking the death bird, a self-inflicted curse that ties the spirits of these loyal knights to the land, having willingly beheaded themselves so that they may serve their masters in death. The sigil of an eclipsed sun is emblazoned upon their shields, a symbol of the protective star of soulless demigods. It aids the mausoleum knights by keeping destined death at bay. Resolute, the knights stand eternal, awaiting the rise of the slumbering demigods. The peninsula to Limgrave South is named for its unceasing rainfall, redolent of lament. It is in this place, the Weeping Peninsula, where we meet Irina. She reveals that the servants of Castle Morn have rebelled. Her father Edgar secretly escorted her from the premises, but he remained behind. Edgar's honor would not allow him to leave the castle in such dire hands. Written upon a silk handkerchief is a letter from Irina to her father, an attempt to convince him to abandon the castle. She then hands the message to the tarnished, instructing them to deliver it to her father. Having made the journey to Castle Morn, we see that it is overrun by misbegotten. The denizens of the castle were met with a grim fate. Their burnt corpses are stacked high and strung from the ramparts. A mad pumpkin head also resides here, a gladiator who attempted to stifle his panic by encasing his head within the dark confines of his helmet. Despite this, he was driven mad by bloodshed. At last, we discover Edgar, sat alone atop a tower. I'm Edgar, warden of this castle, as ordained by Lord Godric himself. But you can see how things have turned out. The menials have all rebelled. They gave me good service, or so I thought. But it seems it was all an act. Delivering Irina's letter, Edgar displays his gratitude but reaffirms that he cannot leave until he reclaims the sword of Castle Morn. Navigating to the battered shores of the peninsula, the Tarnished and Edgar battle the Leonine Misbegotten, a much larger and ferocious counterpart to the Misbegotten encountered earlier. In the creature's possession is the blade Edgar seeks. Together, the duo slaughters the misbegotten, prying the grafted blade greatsword from his corpse. The sword is a relic of a champion, one who defeated an entire clan of warriors, cementing their swords within a single armament. No longer duty-bound, Edgar leaves the castle behind, only to find his daughter deceased. Greena, how could this be? My daughter deserved better. The fault lies with me. I chose duty over my daughter's safety. And that is how fate has answered. 
I'll find them. The foul wretch is responsible for this. I'll hunt them down and exterminate every last one of them. Rest assured, Irina, it will be done. In our absence, Irina perished, a tragic fate for any father to bear. The blood-soaked murder weapon found plunged into the ground is reminiscent of the misbegotten, insinuating that one had ventured from the castle and killed Irina. This single act drives Edgar to the edge of sanity, fueling his bloodlust. Perhaps he felt that her blood was on his hands. He was unable to protect her, and the very creatures he contested with ended her life. At a later point in time, Edgar turns his weapon to us, no longer of sound mind. The broken knight fails to see reason. The tarnished has no choice but to retaliate. Perhaps in death, Edgar and Irina can be united once more. Journeying through Limgrave, the tarnished discovers the waypoint runes. Housed within is the sorceress Selen, a stern practitioner of magic. If requested to teach us sorcery, Selen reveals much of her backstory. She hails from Rhea Lucaria Academy. The authorities of the Institute exiled her from the Academy, labeling her as an apostate witch. Regardless, the tarnished desire to learn sorceries cannot be dismayed. Selen agrees to teach us and elaborates on the history of glintstone sorcery. Our art draws upon the powers embedded in glintstone. But what is the nature of such power? Glintstone is the amber of the cosmos. Golden amber contains the remnants of ancient life and houses its vitality while glinstone contains residual life, and thus, the vitality of the stars. It should not be forgotten that glinstone's sorcery is the study of the stars and the life therein. To the north of Limgrave, we encounter the extravagant Kenneth Height. He compels the Tarnished to reclaim his fort in the south as it has been overtaken by a knight commander from Stormvale. The man's hatred of Godric is made clear, as he recounts the Lord's many failures. His animosity most likely stems from the theft of his fort by one of Godric's underlings. Kenneth also views himself as the rightful Lord of Limgrave, further fueling his contempt. Once Fort Height is cleared, Kenneth rewards the Tarnished with an Erdsteel dagger, an object suggesting that Kenneth is of Erdtree royalty. Interestingly, he says that as part of his rule, he will establish contact with the Demi-Humans once more, as according to him, under the rule of true order, the Vulgar should not be left behind. Furthermore, he enlists the Tarnished into his service, promising them the reward of knighthood. After a while, the nobleman returns to Fort Height and admits he does not have the authority to grant the title of knight to the Tarnished, as Godric is currently the Lord of Limgrave. Although he sees himself as the deserved ruler of this land, he proclaims that he will search for a stalwart lord of the proper lineage, presumably to aid in his rule of Limgrave. For now, we leave him behind and venture to the stronghold of Godric the Grafted. Steadfast, the Tarnished enters Stormvale Castle. Before long, they are halted by Margit, the fell omen. The reclusive king of Landell capital hunts the Tarnished attempting to snuff out their flame of ambition. Having slaughtered countless champions during the Shattering, the Fell Omen has become a horror to those who harbour ambitions for the Erdtree, or for Lordship. Wielding a staff and conjuring phantasms of golden weaponry, Margit displays his might. The grace given delivers blow after blow, but the Tarnished will not yield. Rising from each death, the Tarnished endures, learning from each encounter. Recalling the item they obtained from Patches, Margit's shackle is activated. 
resulting in the fell omen being temporarily imprisoned by the seal of the Erd Tree. Capitalizing on this narrow window of opportunity, the tarnished assails Margit. In the end, they lift their blade and deliver a decisive blow, bringing the monarch to his knees. The fell omen warns that he will show no mercy the next time they meet. Although his hunt was halted momentarily, Margit is certain we will cross paths again. It is important to note that upon his defeat, we do not obtain his great rune, implying that he either retreated before we could obtain it, or he did not have it in his possession at the time. Maybe Morgoth believed he would not require this boon of power when dealing with lowly tarnished. Crossing the bridge, we come upon the gates of Stormvale. Gatekeeper Gostok advises us to take the side entrance into the castle. He warns not to enter through the main gate, as it is heavily guarded. By taking a detour, the Tarnished can infiltrate the castle undetected. Although Gostok offers reasonable advice, he is not a selfless individual. Should the Tarnished die within the castle, the Gatekeeper will steal a portion of their runes. This is hardly a surprise, considering Stormvale is home to Godric and his ilk. At last, we enter the heart of Stormvale Castle. All manner of men and creatures defend this landmark. Lion guardians prowl the paths, grafted scions scurry the dark corners of the keep, and lastly, banished knights. Soldiers who, whether by misfortune or misdeed, were forced to abandon their homes. Most of these knights were sent to the fringes, where they were forced to start anew, with only despair for company. These fierce warriors were each and all accomplished. Perhaps that is why, despite their territorial losses, they were still named knights. Interestingly, Edgar, the commander of Castle Morn, was once a banished knight, as seen by his armour. History also tells us of two renowned banished knights, known as the Wings of the Storm. The first, Oleg, allied himself with Morgoth, slaying a hundred traitors in his lord's name, earning the honour of Erdtree burial. The other, Angval, rejected the invitation of the grace given, choosing to keep watch over a masterless castle for many years, gaining renown as a hero of the fringes. These shunned yet able fighters travel the lands, with some choosing to fight in the name of Godric. Exploring the inner confines, we come across a lavish painting of Godfrey. Godric's love of his forebear is clearly displayed, Many limbs of grafted victims are suspended from the ceiling, perhaps signifying that Godric is attempting to match his ancestor in power through the act of grafting. The painting serves as a reminder as to why he commits such atrocities upon the denizens of Limgrave. During our foray, we meet the sorcerer, Rogier. His spellblade attire is reminiscent of aristocracy, hinting at his origin. He notes that the castle is filled to the brim with tarnished hunters who seek worthy foes to sacrifice for grafting. Furthermore, Rogier states that he seeks something in the castle, something that warrants exploring such a dangerous location. Few can see beneath the veneer of his affable persona. According to his attire, Rogier spent his entire life behaving with utter detachment. No one noticed the anger, grief, regret, or fear that existed along with it. Perhaps he has knowledge of a frightening truth, one which he is hesitant to share with any other. In a dark room deep within the keep, a woman stands above a deceased banished knight. Conversing with her reveals that she is Nefeli Lu, a capable fighter who suggests forming an alliance to challenge Godric the Grafted. It should be mentioned that her familial name, Lu, is identical to Horalu, the royal name of Godfrey, first Elden Lord. 
a link that suggests she is a descendant of the chieftain of the Badlands. All that remains is to venture through the fog and confront Godric the Grafted, his form almost twisted beyond recognition due to the countless victims grafted onto his frame. He wields a golden battle axe emblazoned with the figure of a beast, representing the strength of Godfrey, first Elden Lord and patriarch of the golden lineage. Godric refers to himself as the Lord of all that is golden, a self-assigned title, believing himself to be worthy of the moniker Elden Lord. His erratic combat style displays little sense of strategy. He brawls like a mad beast, as opposed to a skilled master of combat. As the tarnished gains the upper hand, Godric amputates his arm. Grafting once more, he fuses the head of a dragon to his wrist, bending the reanimated creature to his will. He sprouts forth a torrent of fire. This newfound power is not enough. Narrowly avoiding the reign of fire, the tarnished executes Godric, obtaining his great rune. First, Godric was hounded from the capital by Radan, then defeated by Millennia, and lastly, felled by a nameless tarnished. A coward dies many times before their death. It is only the Valiant who tastes death once. What a pathetic excuse for a lord you were. <laughs> Craven to the bone. Pushing me about like that, and after all that grafting, where did that get you? Look down on me, would ya? Godric, you filthy slug. Feel it, feel it, feel my bloody wrath. With no fear of retaliation, the gatekeeper chastises the fallen lord. It seems even those who followed Godric did so out of fear, not loyalty. With Godric slain, the tarnished attains the great rune of the Shardbearer. To understand the significance of a great rune and its utility, the Tarnish ventures to a place ripe with knowledge and wisdom, a safe haven for those wandering the lands between, with a path unclear. Oh, this is a rare occasion. I can't remember the last time a new Tarnished made their way to the round table. Allow me a word of advice, as your senior. You are a mere visitor to the round table, nothing more. A house guest, yet to earn their keep. Following a warm welcome by Sir Gideon Ofne, the All-Knowing, the Tarnished finds himself at the covert quarters of the Two Fingers, the Round Table Hold, a gathering place for all manner of adventurers, craftsmen, and warriors who vie to mend the Elden Ring and become Elden Lord. Champions would gather at the Round Table Hold in days long past, when the Two Fingers were masters of oration, their flesh yet full of vigour. As leader of the Round Table, Gideon vowed to become all-knowing, gathering information on the lands between and piecing together all he could on the infamous Shardbearers who had claimed the shattered remains of the Elden Ring. Gideon's two most trusted servants were his adopted daughter, Nefeli Lu, and his right-hand man, Ensher of the Royal Remains. Ensher's armour is composed of bones that belong to an ancient lord, the Soulless King, the Lord of the Lost and Desperate, who was known as Ensher. Not only does the armour not belong to the servant, but neither does his name. Gideon's reaction to the Tarnished infers that the Round Table had long lost its glory, with very few finding their way to it. But this does not discourage Gideon's search for truth. Knowledge begins with the recognition of one's ignorance, the realization that the search for knowledge is unending. Upon arrival, the Tarnished is directed towards the Two Fingers to seek their guidance for the journey ahead. Circling the round table, Brother Corrin can be found. He is a man of cloth, one who explores the secrets of the Golden Order and teaches the strength granted by the Two Fingers through incantations. His reason for this is so that one day, if a tarnished of the round table hold should become Elden Lord, I might counsel them, ensuring order regains its proper form 
writing rule over men. Moving ahead, Knight Dialos of House Hoslo can be encountered. He's notorious for being all talk but little action, and for this reason, his older brother Juno inherited the family legacy with little resistance. Juno was a stern, self-possessed man of a few words. His achievements made him seem out of reach, and so the younger aspired to be like the older, yearning for the day that he would tell the tale of House Hoslo in blood, knowing full well that it would break his brother's heart. Having met the Tarnished, Dialos is keen to question the newcomer, asking if they had rubbed shoulders with a woman by the name Lanya. She's my servant, but fickle as the wind. Take your eyes off her for but a moment and she's good as gone. The words of Dialos assure that losing sight of Lanya is of common occurrence, and yet he worries for her safety, as she's no mere servant, but a companion since childhood. Also at the round table is Sorcerer Roger, who was earlier met at Stormvale. He reveals his true intentions behind exploring the castle, explaining that he wishes to uncover the secrets of the Shattering and the Black Knife Conspiracy. Encroaching upon a hidden path, Roger discovered a misshapen corpse below Stormvale, belonging to none other than Godwin himself. The sorceress' curiosity got the best of him, as by approaching the corpse, Roger was impaled through the chest and left inflicted with death blight. Now at the round table, his condition appears to have worsened. He warns the tarnished that he is on the brink of a deep slumber. With what little time he has left, he urges that a black knife print in addition to the curse mark of death be retrieved to aid in his study. These key items reveal the objective truth of what took place on the fateful Night of the Black Knives, the catalyst to the shattering of the Elden Ring. Having learned that Luna Princess Rani orchestrated the plot, Roger states the following. Can you become Rani's vassal to advance our agenda? While in her service, you'll be able to take a poke around on the sly and determine the location of her original body that bears the curse mark. I realize that I'm asking you to put yourself in grave danger but I know you've got what it takes. Placing his trust in the Tarnished, Roger can rest easy, knowing the truth will inevitably surface. The sorcerer falls into a slumber, one that he would not awake from. Beside the hearth of a warm fire, the Tarnished is reunited with the woman from Stormhill Shack, who reveals herself as Rodrika. Empowered by the champions of the round table, she too seeks a purpose of her own, in the distance, the unrelenting sound of a hammer striking an anvil echoes through the labyrinthine halls of the hold, put to work by smithing master Hoog, a chained craftsman who labours to no end. I'm a prisoner and these are my chains. I'm trapped by the hold. I'm dying smithing for you fools. The girl you bore here, she's crestfallen and can scarcely swing a blade. But she has a gift for spirit tuning. Perhaps here lies Rodrika's purpose. In the room beyond the craftsman resides a woman by the name Fia, a deathbed companion who once drew vigor from numerous champions and laid with an exalted noble who had passed, channeling the energy she had harnessed into his deceased body in the hopes that he would draw breath once more. But before I could bear the noble into new life, I was awakened by the guidance of grace and chased from my birthplace. What Fia viewed as a sacred act was condemned by others, regarded as vulgar, and thus she was exiled from her homeland. Traveling to the lands between, Fia would cross paths with Lionel the Lionhearted, when this chivalrous dauntless knight met Fia, who had been driven from her home, he declared himself to be her father. Despite her tribulations, Fia still wished to be a deathbed companion. The death of the first demigod Godwin led to the emergence of those who live in death. Deemed as pitiful products of unending life, they were hunted by the Golden Order. Having experienced similar prejudice, Fia was sympathetic to the undead and wished to act as their protector. She, along with her followers, believed that Godwin 
will one day be reborn as the Prince of Death and rise up against the tyranny of the Golden Order. This begs the question, why does the deathbed companion reside at the round table? It appears her cards are kept close to the chest, as her schemes remain concealed from the tarnished. Ahead lies Finger Reader Enya, as the voices of the two fingers, Finger Readers are said to live lives eternal, and one is even supposed to have served as a wet nurse to royalty. The two fingers are served by former assassins of the round table, those who were tarnished themselves and had lost the guidance of grace. Recruited by the fingers, they took charge of eliminating others who had found grace lost. There was a time when tarnished who had strayed from guidance feared nothing more than utter silence. Conversing with Enya, the words of the two fingers channel through her. Great Elden Ring, root of the Golden Order, anchor of all lands, giver of grace, wellspring of all joy. Until it was shattered, the tragic corruption of the Order has taken its toll. Across the realm, Life lies in ruin, fallen to pieces. Foul curses and misery spread, unabating. But the greater will has not abandoned the realm, nor the life that inhabits it. So it is that the tarnished are guided by grace, called to act. Brave tarnished, your great rune is a handsome shard of the Elden Ring. Seek another of its kind to become Elden Lord and restore the Golden Order. With their purpose engraved, the tarnished sets their gaze to the acquisition of the remaining great runes held by the demigods to carry them to the heart of the Erd Tree and reforge the Elden Ring, as Lord Radagon once attempted. The Two Fingers has high hopes for the Tarnished, that even if they should be wounded, even should they fall, they will continue to fight for their duty. The Tarnished travels to Lyurnia of the Lakes, in search of Queen Renala of the Full Moon, who clutches an amber egg inhabiting the Great Rune of the Unborn, given to her by Radagon. The majority of Lyurnia, known for its vast forests and ever-present fog, is sinking into a lake. The Academy of Rhea Lucaria towers over the north, while at its base spreads the town built around it, now flooded. As the Tarnished emerges from Stormvale Castle, they are met with a mysterious woman. With her eyes concealed behind a blindfold, she awaits at the lake-facing cliffs. My name is Hayata, and I'm journeying in search of the distant light. If I might be so bold as to ask, would you donate any Shabriri grapes in your possession to me? Hayata is a blind maiden in search of a distant light that would allow her to become a finger maiden. Maidens traverse the lands between for different reasons, some to seek audience with the fingers, others to find the tarnished who they were destined to guide. Hayata believes that to reach the source of light, she must call upon the help of a Shibriri grape, described as a yellowing oozing eyeball of the infirm. The surface is shriveled and the inside is squishy, not unlike a large overly ripe grape. Throughout their journey into Lyurnia, the tarnished crosses paths with Hayata on multiple occasions, be it at the petrified ruins, Gate Town Bridge or Bellum Church. With every meeting, Hayata requests a Shibriri grape to further guide her. Upon sensing the nearing of the light, she makes one final request, to be presented with a fingerprint grape, eyeball of the night vike, inflamed yellow, seared with a repulsive fingerprint burn, akin to those that marred his entire body. Shabriri grapes are human eyes, and the fingerprint grape is the eye of an infamous knight of the round table hold, Vike. 
No other tarnished was closer to the throne of the Alden Lord than Vike. But without announcement, Vike travelled far below the capital and was scorched by the flame of frenzy. Did he make his choice for his maiden, or did some other force lure him with suggestion? It appears that Hayata wishes to follow in Vike's footsteps, to travel through the subterranean shunning grounds of the royal capital and seek an audience with the Three Fingers, to present herself to the Flame of Frenzy. Why would Hayata wish for such an end? Upon closer inspection, things begin to make sense. Hayata is noticeably similar to Irina, identical in voice, face, and even both being blind. Theories suggest that following Irina's death, her body was possessed by none other than the most reviled man in history, Shibriri. Reinforcing this theory is that following the death of Irina's father, a Shibriri grape can be retrieved from his body, suggesting that his sudden descent into madness was no fault of his own. With the knowledge gained, Vike's unforeseen change of alliance is better understood. Why would a knight on the cusp of becoming Elden Lord jeopardize everything they've built towards to sacrifice themselves to the flame of frenzy? Unless, of course, strings were being pulled from the shadows. Alternatively, Vike may have sacrificed himself in place of his maiden. To clear the layer of thorns at the base of the Erd Tree, his maiden would have needed to self immolate at the Forge of the Giants. Although her purpose bids it so, Vike couldn't bear the image of his maiden turned to ashes, and so he pledged his alliance to the Flame of Frenzy. A subsequent means of burning the thorns blocking access to the Erd Tree, one oversight foiled the champion's ploy, entering the palm of the Three Fingers without the removal of his armor. A crucial necessity if one is to be accepted as a servant. Now all that remains is scorched iron, blistered by the Three Fingers. Like Vike before her, Hayata is led down the path of the frenzied flame. In times past, every single person who attempted to control the flame of frenzy succumbed to madness after a desperate internal struggle. Unaware of the powers at play, the Tarnished provides Hayata with the tools required to reach the Forsaken Depths. Beneath Lindell, at the very bottom, lies our Lord, Lord of the Frenzied, the Three Fingers who holds us in thrall. Continuing from the lake-facing cliffs, the Tarnished arrives at the Church of Irith. The church is outside the lands between, dedicated to the teachings of the Two Fingers, send confessors out to follow the guidance of grace. The confessors are loyal servants to the Two Fingers, ready to hunt down and quietly dispose of their enemies. Inside the church, a glintstone sorcerer named Topes can be found. He is a member of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. However, whilst he was absent, the shattering took place and the Academy's gates were sealed shut, making entry impossible without a glintstone key. Once presented with a key, Topes will depart from the church and return to the Academy. He is later found dead at his desk, located at the Academy's graveyard, and in his palms, a sorcery can be acquired revealing Topes' truth. The lifelong pursuit of Topes the Bluntstone, future generations will learn, they will know the foolishness of the sneering sorcerers who ridiculed this theory, little realizing that it was in fact a discovery worthy of a new conspectus of the Academy. From this discovery, we can derive that Topes had been in conflict with his colleagues at the Academy. Whilst he worked tirelessly to create a sorcery worthy of the title Conspectus, which is bestowed upon Rhea Lucaria scholars whose pursuits were deemed worthy, other scholars denounced his theory, scoffing at his ambitious pursuit. His office being placed at the Academy's graveyard speaks volumes on the lack of respect or appreciation that Topes received from his peers. Perhaps he was not unintentionally locked out of the Academy, but cast out instead. Nevertheless, Topes proved himself in the end, 
placing his mark on the academy with a sorcery worthy of the highest honor. In his own words, future generations will learn. They will indeed learn of his commitment and sacrifice to his craft. They mustn't forget the name, Topes the Bluntstone. As the Tarnish travels west of Lyurnia, they arrive at the village of the Albanorix, a place adorned with corpses, revealing a massacre had taken place. The home of the old Albanorix was destroyed by the Cursemongers, but perhaps hope is not lost for them to find their promised land. Albanorix are life forms made by human hands, thus many believe them to live impure lives, untouched by the Earth Tree's grace. Regarded as a lower life form, the Albanorix were hunted by many, including omen killers, one of whom patrols their village. Omen killers pursue accursed beings who were born with traits of the Crucible Era. It appears their jurisdiction extends to any beings born with irregularities. The Albanorix were shunned by all but one place, Mikola's Halic Tree. For this reason, they sought to journey to the Hidden Kingdom. For this revelation, they had Loretta to thank, a once royal carrier knight who went on a journey in search of a haven for Albanorix and determined that the Halic Tree was their best chance for eventual salvation. With hope for a brighter future, the Albanorix wielded ivory sickles as evidence of their dedication to the Halic Tree, despite never having entered its presence. Exploring the ravaged village, the Tarnished finds Albus, an old resident who had survived the massacre by disguising himself with the environment. The Albanorix lived in peace, safeguarding half of a secret medallion which would grant them passage to the Halic Tree. This drew the attention of Sir Gideon Ofnir, who also desired the medallion. By his orders, his men attacked the village, murdering anyone who would stand in their way. The one remaining Albanoric clasped tightly the half medallion and hid until the pillagers had given up their search. The medallion is the key that leads to the city. It's only a quaint treasure for we who cannot make the journey. But for dear Latena, it is needed to fulfill her purpose. My legs will soon fade and with them my life. Alas, this is the immovable fate of all Albinorix. In his dying will, Albus entrusts the medallion to the tarnished, asking them to seek a woman named Latena, who is also an Albinorix. She traveled to Lyurnia along with her wolf companion Lobo in search for a path to the Halic Tree. Taking refuge at the village, she was attacked by the intruders, and as a result, her wolf Lobo was slaughtered, and she was left at death's door. Alas, like a true warrior, she did not surrender the whereabouts of the medallion. Latana lays low at the lakeside crystal cave, inside the slumbering wolf's shack. In exchange for being guided to the Halic Tree, Latana informs of the location of the second half of the medallion, and voluntarily turns into a spirit ash, as to be carried by the tarnished. They say the other half of the medallion is beyond the forbidden lands north of the earth tree, in Castle Sol, on the mountain tops of the giants, accessible by the grand lift of Rold. Before leaving the village, Nefelilu makes an appearance, lamenting the unjust slaughter of the innocent villagers. She's reminded of a similar sighting she witnessed in her infancy. The oppression of the weak. Murder and pillage unchecked. A waking nightmare made by men. She may have been helpless as a child, but now a grown warrior, she vows to seek justice, to let the scars she inflicts be a warning to all who think to prey on the weak. On her return to the Round Table Hold, Nefeli learns that it was her father who ordered the attack on the village. Revealing his true colors, the cruel Gideon turns his back on his daughter. And I can no longer trust in father to think he'd order his men to enact such tragedy. 
Where is the justice he purports in that? Father has always given me his guidance. And now... I've lost it. <laughs> Her brain scattered and fueled by a river of emotion, Nefeli confines herself to the basement of the round table, uncertain how to proceed. To help guide Nefeli out of the depths of her sorrow, the Tarnished gifts her the ashes of an ancient monarch, the Stormhawk King, the remembrance of the revered Hawk, who once ruled over Stormvale, inspires Nefeli to stand firm and persevere through her hardships. Joining forces with Kenneth Height, Nefeli becomes the stalwart lord of Limgrave, reigning over Stormvale Castle. The two can be found at the castle's throne room, sharing command of the region. Along with them is gatekeeper Gostock. Having endured the tyrannical rule of Godric the Grafted, he may finally be content with the new and just monarchy. I have indeed selected a new ruler. Lady Nefeli is strong and just, worthy of the burden of Limgrave's lineage. Such is the sincere opinion of I, Kenneth Height, no less. I remembered the vow I took when I first became a warrior, so many moons ago. This land is much like the one from which I hail. I will call upon the storm to drive away the foulness that has settled on the winds. Returning back to Lyurnia, a peaceful village hidden on the side of a cliff can be found. It is home to many friendly Jars, who wish only to be left alone. Jarburn is a young resident of the village, and nephew to Iron Fist Alexander. Akin to his uncle, Jarburn dreams to one day leave the comfort of home and tread the warrior's path. He expresses that until he finds a worthy potentate to care for his village, he is unable to, in good conscience, leave Jarburg. The Tarnished offers to care for the village in his absence. However, Jarburn's assessment reveals him unsuitable for the task at hand. <sighs> Your skin isn't so smooth, is it? You need slick slidey hands to be potentate, you know? I'm sorry, cuz. But I don't think you've got what it takes. What a shame. Hopefully a day will come where the sun rises on a worthy leader to alleviate the burden carried by Jarburn. Traveling further, the Tarnished reunites with the mischievous Patches at the Scenic Isle. You're making your way to the Erd Tree, no? Well, uh, I heard something that might help. A special means of reaching your destination. Patches recommends the Tarnished allow themselves to be captured by an abductor virgin, expressing that it has unique transpositional powers, which will transport them to the base of the Erd Tree. To no surprise, Patches is once again up to no good. Rather than the Erd Tree, the Abductor Virgin transports the Tarnished to the Inquisition Chambers of Volcano Manor. Alas, the Tarnished knows better than to take advice from a trickster. With that said, Patches does prove useful after all. By the way, uh, have you met that girl Raya? She's a strange one, but I believe she was in need of help. Raya is found east of the Scenic Isle. She is a servant to Lady Tanith of Volcano Manor and is currently scouting the lands of Lyurnia for potential recruits. My mistress sent me off on an errand, but I was accosted by a ruffian. And now I'm in a bind. That thug made off with a precious necklace. I need someone to retrieve it. Raya speaks of a petty criminal who had stolen her necklace, the Blackguard Big Bogart. It appears that selling boiled prawns and crab alone isn't sufficient for a life of riches. Avoiding unnecessary conflict, the Tarnished purchases the necklace back from the thief and returns it to its rightful owner. Before making her return home, Raya places a letter of invitation in our palm. Brave Tarnished, seek the Altus Plateau in the realm of the Erd Tree. 
prove yourself by making this journey and the Volcano Manor will fully extend its invitation to fight amongst a family of champions. A generous offer for another time, as for the thieving merchant, delighting in his food will form a bond between the tarnished and the blackguard, even if his so-called crab looks to have come from a crayfish. Not that it matters, it's delicious all the same. Heading towards Northern Lyurnia, we enter the Academy Gate town, where we once again come to find Knight Dialos. Leaving no stone unturned, the scion of House Hoslo had found his servant Lanya. With her body painted in dry blood, Dialos stands in mourning. He deduces that her death was at the hands of those who serve Volcano Manor and swears vengeance upon them. They laid hands upon my servant Lanya and I refuse to let the insult stand. The tale of House Hoslo is told in blood. I, Dialos, swear to deliver the message. At the entrance of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, the Tarnished happens upon a corpse possessing a map. The map seems to point to a meeting place. The man it came from surely desired one, the sole means of gaining entry into the Academy, a Glintstone key. Following the directions given, the Tarnished comes to face Glintstone Dragon Smarag, a colossal beast who dwells west of the Academy. Smarag was a devourer of sorcerers, and over time, his body became corrupted by their glintstones. As a result, his fire breath became infused with glintstone magic. Felling the dragon procures a glintstone key, allowing the tarnished to set foot in the Academy. As a protective barrier, a spell was once cast from the highest belfry of the Academy covering the entire institution's grounds. Within the academy, scholars populate the majority of its halls, utilizing glintstone in defense of their institution. Glintstone is the foundation of sorcery, which serves as a conduit, launching magical projectiles at foes. This is a universal first step on the journey to true knowledge of sorcery. It is said that Glintstone Sorcery was founded by an ancient astrologer through the discovery of the eldest primeval sorcery, the founding reign of stars. The glimpse of the primeval current that the astrologer saw became real, and the star's amber rained down on this land. The meteor that struck also gave rise to a race of ancients with skin of stone, known as Alabaster Lords. Furthermore, Glintstone sorcerers are the descendants of astrologers, a fact that the Carrions remain aware of, even if their fate has been long severed from the stars. Queen Renala was once a young astrologer, one who gazed at the night sky as she walked. She had always chased the stars every step of her journey. Then she met the full moon, and in time, the astrologer became a queen. Since the age of the Earth Tree, Carrion astrology withered on the vine. The fate once writ in the night skies had been fettered by the Golden Order. Evidently, the Order did not approve of Carrion astrology, likely out of fear of the age of the stars. As time passed, the uncovering of the primeval current created a rift between sorcerers. It became a forbidden tradition of Glintstone sorcery. Yet, to those who cleave to its teachings, the act of collecting sorcerers to fashion them into the seeds of stars is but another path of scientific inquiry. Despite it being heretical, there were prominent figures within Rhea Lucaria who were tempted by the reign of stars. When Azur glimpsed into the primeval current, he saw darkness. He was left both bewitched and fearful of the abyss. Sorcerer Lusat beheld the final moments of a great star cluster, and upon seeing it, he too was broken. The tolerance for such disloyalty was close to none, resulting in the scholar's banishment. Since the Grand Masters Azur and Lusat were driven from the academy, no one has achieved their formerly held rank. In time, the School of Graven Mages was formed to continue the teachings of Primeval Current, 
In consequence, practitioners of the forbidden sorcery malformed into a spherical amalgamation of glintstone crowns, reflecting two former Rayo Lucaria students, Olivinus and Lazuli. The lineage of the Olivinus Conspectus began with the sorcerer Lusat, and its adherents continue his study of meteors. On the other hand, scholars of Lazuli Conspectus adopted a heterodox pursuit that views the moon as equal to the stars. Some meddled with forbidden sorceries, whilst others lived by them. The Crystallians are inorganic beings, yet they live. They cleave close to the ideals of the primeval current, and as such, they are revered guests of the sorcerers. They were so proficient that the Crystal Carda, a group of sorcerers, studied the Crystallians in the hopes of accessing the secrets locked in their faint cognition. The Crystallians' faint cognition is known as the Wisdom of Stone. The inscrutable Crystallians have but one clear purpose, to safeguard their crystals unto the end. One theory posits that they yearn for the return of their creator, who will carve them new brethren. Primeval Current is but one form of sorcery disgraced by the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. Another is Aberrant Sorcery, which is derived from a blood star. This form of magic draws its power from faith. It was discovered along with Red Glintstone by those exiled to the north for committing unspoken crimes. Their punishment was severe. The guilty, their eyes gouged by thorns, lived in eternal darkness. There, they discovered the Blood Star. Incidentally, Stone Digger sorcery was also criticized. Although not forbidden, it is a mark of a failed scholar, a stigma that extends to the glintstone miners of the crystal tunnels. Maneuvering through the academy, the tarnished must stay vigilant, as the scholars are not to be mistaken for mere academics. They are formidable fighters in their own right. A glintstone arc, was granted to sorcerers who depart from the academy to embark on journeys in order to fend off large groups of would-be adversaries. Their faith in the stars offered them immense confidence on their expeditions. Even during the blackest nights, sojourns underground, or imprisonment in jail, the stars are never far from a sorcerer's side. At the peak of a long and arduous journey, the Tarnish enters the domain of the Carrion Queen. Countless juvenile scholars are seen scattered throughout the Grand Library, whilst Renala hovers above ground. Believing that her daughter Rani died during the Night of the Black Knives, Renala devotes herself to the art of reincarnation. Some speculate that she embraces her amber egg in the hopes of one day resurrecting her daughter. In a futile attempt, Renala fights to ward off the intruder, but neither her magic nor her scholars are equal to the tarnished. Defeated, Renala desperately crawls towards her amber egg. Shortly before her fate is sealed, the voice of Lunar Princess Rani can be heard, revealing that she had survived the Night of the Black Knives and has since kept a watchful eye on her mother. Upon my name is Rani the Witch, Mother's rich slumber shall not be disturbed by thee. Foul trespasser. Send word far and wide. Of the last queen of Caria, Renala of the full moon. of the night she conjureth. Rani conjures an apparition of her mother in her prime to challenge the tarnished on equal grounds. Born anew, Renala's sorcery is unrelenting, firing all manner of projectiles and summoning various creatures to fight on her behalf. Although formidable, she falls short once more and the tarnished champion claims the great rune of the unborn. With the battle won, mercy is granted to the Carrion Queen, 
Renala accepts her fate and remains in the Grand Library, tending to her amber egg and offering her services of rebirth. In search of Rani, the last princess, we travel north of Lyurnia, towards the home of the Carian family. This territory once belonged to the Carian royal family. Their manor lies not far beyond this point. When the Rhea Lucari Academy turned on the Carians, the Knights of the Cuckoo descended on this tract. After leveling it, they carried on to the manor. The Carians were taken off guard, but their strength had not waned and they repelled the Knight's onslaught by conjuring an enchanted snare that remains potent to this day. War Counselor E.G., a close ally of the Carrion family, warns of a dangerous spell that surrounds Carrier Manor and prays the Tarnished turns back at once. The manor appears desolate and the atmosphere clouded with a bluish hue. Every step taken runs the risk of falling into an ambush. A finger creeper dwells around every corner and spectral knights hide in the shadows. The Tarnished treads carefully with their weapon at the ready. At the moon gazing grounds, the Eternal Warden, Royal Knight Loretta, awaits. This adversary takes the spectral form of Loretta, Knight of the Halig Tree, who journeyed far in search of a haven for the Albanorix. The spirit who appears before us is the same proud knight, but from a time when they were in service to the Carian royal family. From atop her steed, Loretta punishes would-be trespassers with the use of her sorcery, great bow, and glintstone-infused warsicle. Vanquishing the royal knight opens the path to the three sisters, a secluded land barred from outside interference. Similar to Carrier Manor, the surroundings are perpetually shrouded by mist. In addition to colossal pillars of glintstone piercing outwards from the soils of the earth, as the Tarnished closes on Rani's rise, glintstone dragon Ajula emerges from the fog. Ajula, a devourer of sorcerers, was bested by Rani and subsequently swore a knightly oath to her dark moon. As a protector of the Lunar Princess, Ajula engages the Tarnished in combat, but before the battle concludes, the towering dragon retreats, living to fight another day. Rani sits atop a high-rise tower, anticipating the arrival of the Tarnished. Here, we verify that Rani was the culprit behind the Knight of the Black Knives. Chosen by her own two fingers, Rani was to be a successor to Marika to become the new god of the coming age. But destiny would not impose its will on the Lunar Princess. The women of the Carian royal family look to the moon to guide their fates. Rani's is a moon dark and blanketed with rhyme. Carving her own fate, Rani turned her back on the two fingers and now seeks to rid the world of their influence. Accepting the tarnished into her ranks, she introduces her most trusted allies, some of whom we had already met. There is in my service a half-woven warrior by the name of Blythe. I would have thee join him in searching for the hidden treasure of Nokron, the Eternal City. Ah, and there wilt thou find E.G., my war counsellor, and Salavis, preceptor in the sorcerous arts also. Heed not their peculiarities. Feel secure in gaining from them what advantage thou canst. Blythe. Salavus and E.G. are all working in service of the Tarnished, who prepares to journey to the Eternal City of Nokron and claim a hidden treasure, harboring a means of slaying the Two Fingers, a daunting mission bestowed upon a more than capable champion. The future of the lands between remains uncertain, Queen Marika imprisoned, shards of the Elden Ring scattered, and the Elden Throne vacant. The road ahead is long and grueling, with many demigods yet to be fought, hidden cities yet to be explored, and most importantly, destiny yet to be defied.
Thank you so much for watching. This marks the end of the second chapter of Elden Ring Story Explained. A huge thank you to our patrons, who have allowed us to continue working on this hobby, which we love so much. Without you guys, none of it would be possible. Please click the link in the description to find out more on how to get early access to our videos, receive frequent updates on upcoming projects, and be mentioned in the credits of all of our content. Please click the subscribe button to stay up to date on future installments in the series. Leave a like as it helps our content reach a wider audience. And comment letting us know your thoughts on the video. Stay tuned as there is still much to be explored, such as character stories and world building lore surrounding the locations and bosses of Elden Ring. We must say our goodbyes for now, but we will be back with more very soon.